Hey everybody, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat. I'm talking today with Marius. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. It's. Uh, I was thinking I was going to complain about the winter storm that's hitting. Oh, here. yeah, but, yeah. Know. But that's hitting here hard. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so for folks that don't know you, who are you? Where are you? And what do you do? Yeah. So my name is Marius Solbakken Mellum. I'm located in. Uh, well, a tiny town called Bumendal in uh, in Norway, uh, along with another Marius MVP in the same tiny town in Norway. <laughs> oh, that's convenient. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I'm a principal cloud engineer in Amesto 42, focused on identity, security, and building uh, managed services. So it's a, it's a small company where I'm also a partner. Um, yeah, I'm the host of the cloud first podcast with this other Marius just so <laughs> to to make sure that we we are mixed together uh, yeah, ever like, so is it, often is it called like Marius squared or anything like it, yeah it should be <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, very uh, cool is, and so how long have you been an MVP now uh for uh, a whole month yeah so yeah. long long time <laughs> So, I, so I'd like to ask you, I want you to go in the way back machine to prior mm -hmm. to being an MVP. What, what was your path to becoming an MVP? Like, what, what was that journey like for you? Yeah, so uh, I've always been very interested in, um, well, first of all, podcasting. I've, I always found uh, uh, very enjoyable, uh, as well as uh, essentially just finding, uh, uh, like digging deep into, for example, Azure AD, uh, looking into what's behind the, or what's under the hood here and really investigating and finding out uh, how things really work. Because, well, you can read the documentation and understand what things do, but yeah. not necessarily understand what they really do. And um, yeah, so, so my blog has been very focused on that uh, area. And uh, yeah, I've been blogging for a long time. Um, I've always been very wide when it comes to like the, uh, let's call it the contribution area. So yeah. um, both um, like security, some more of, of over to the Microsoft 365 side yeah. and um, a lot of Azure stuff. Um, yeah. That, all things Microsoft Cloud, essentially. That, that could be confusing for people that it's like, look, I'm doing a lot like out in the community, but if you're, I, and I just talked about this in a previous in an interview not too long ago, a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. is that it to become an MVP, it has to be very focused. Yes, in, and that's uh, that, that's essentially why I haven't been an MVP before, to be honest. Um, I have been um, um, what's it called um, nominated, but yeah. um, I've been too too broad uh, essentially, and and yeah, so a few or too few um contributions in every single topic but yeah many but still yeah so uh, but right now i've been more focused on on security for a good while so yeah well that's uh, yeah it, I, I know that there are some people that as i was talking before we started recording that were enterprise mobility mvps and then they became they moved over to security yep. mvps because that mm -hmm. could be that it was traditionally because I think security is a new focus area. Yes, it was within other. There's security. Yes, and uh, all uh, products, people. I, I don't, I, so essentially, identity and access has moved yeah. to over to security, right? Because that was primarily put under uh, um, well, enterprise mobility, right. but not identity when it came to Azure. And uh, I, I think that was sort of the difficult part there. Well, I think that's why why you sometimes have MVPs who may do a lot of they they could be like a, a um, m365 development mvp but then start doing more and more with azure and identity and so they yeah. start as they because for folks that don't know mvps is we track our contributions the things that we do that are not for our work for our job but for pure for community but you identify like which category which topic area each fall in mm. and so sometimes just more and more of them seem to be stacking up in that if in this case the identity security uh, uh space 
Microsoft yeah, I, could switch your MVP over to that other yeah. area, which I think is happening. Yeah. Or you could and, find yourself a dual MVP suddenly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, these days, when you do anything, it's all within IT, um, then it's almost identity related in some way. Well, it's always that. Yeah. So well, at least some portion. So. <laughs> so, so what are kind of the, what are the hot topics that you're, you're talking about? What are you digging into like through the podcast, your blog right now, or, or presenting out in uh, community activities? Yeah. So right now it's um, a lot of focus on, um, on um, while well, security monitoring with like Sentinel. Um, there's a lot of talk going around um, external identities and how you handle your, well, guest accounts or customers or... That's, that's a topic yeah. that covers many different areas, yeah. Absolutely. Right. And um, yeah, I'm looking more and more into decentralized identities as well, which is hmm. uh, becoming more and more interesting. Right now, um, the customers and let's call them the sort of the providers of the data and the consumers. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of a chicken and egg problem when it comes to adopting decentralized identities because no one really cares about adding uh, support for decentralized identities when there are no providers of, well, your identities. Mm -hmm. So, but that, I'm, I'm sure this will become much more, um, uh, well, actively used in the coming three or four years or something yeah so in your do you, your content do you cover like customer scenarios do you talk more about kind of the pure product and kind of delve into the minutia of the technology or yeah more of the technology focus absolutely yeah so um real deep dives into uh, for example the, the, the way I, I write blog posts is often I I want to find out how, let's say, privileged identity management works. Mm -hmm. Then I look at the APIs. I, I look at the Azure portal. I see what, what does it really do behind the scenes, like looking at the different API calls that actually do, because sometimes then you, you can find some hidden hidden features not documented anywhere. Yep. Perhaps nothing you should re rely on in production, but still gives you more like insight into how things really behave and potential future for products, for example, where you see that, okay, so they made some, some stuff in the API. It doesn't really make sense when it comes to, to the Azure portal and what you see as a, like a regular admin. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, you can, you, you can essentially from that, uh, um, I guess, sort of say that, well, within a year or two, I guess, this is sort of the direction they're going. They're adding some of these features potentially. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's essentially just digging into those things that are my blog posts. Well, you know, it's, and, and this is coming from a non-engineer, but I've been in IT for over 30 years is that, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's like, it's doing a, you know, trying to, to find a problem, doing a trace route, trying to work, go through, a workflow going through the APIs, yep. understanding the calls that are being made, where things, so where you start to understand like, hey, it's working today, but it's slower. How can we make it faster? Um, let's look mm -hmm. at the way that it's it's pulling together. Oh, I see it's doing round trips that it doesn't need to be doing. We can architect this differently. And, and uh, you know, with, it's always interesting too, with Microsoft, do they, when you get into in deep with the products, Mm. understand how they're doing some of what they're doing. Um, it could be the reason why there's like, why isn't there this feature? Why isn't Microsoft given this? Well, the way yeah. that it's architected yeah. for these reasons, that's why. Uh, and so you do, you can better understand the impact mm. of change inside your organization. Like, Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I get all Very that. Points. It's not part of my life, my daily life. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, but no, I get that. I mean, I used to live in that that world. Um, um, you know, uh, uh, but uh, you have know, not been part of uh, engineering, running engineering teams for quite a few years now. But mm. um, no, it's fascinating stuff, especially when you're looking at optimizing solutions, performance improvements. Um, yeah, and and also when you so so I do a lot of like. Yeah, well, call them customer engagements or whatever, but um, where where I um, uh, say, um, 
su come with suggestions on how they can use Azure AD as like their primary uh, identity governance platform. Also, with like right back to the um, Active Directory on premises and um, uh, things like that, which are just it's either preview features or um, um, yeah, something like that. Uh, but then then it's very necessary to 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 actually know where where are things moving where, where so if you're implementing something now and you know this is something that will well it will either go away or mm -hmm. some yeah you, you you wouldn't implement the active directory federation services today right so um um it's sort of the same thing in um in azure ad as as well uh, where there are certain features that uh, will get a lot of more features uh, over time, and uh, perhaps you can um, well uh, make uh, design decisions now that you, you're you're actually going to use this service. So perhaps right now you need some plumbing to to get it to work the way you want it to. Mm -hmm. But um, in six months, a year, or something, it will do everything out of the box. Yeah. Well, but then there still will have to be a transition. And if you've done mm -hmm. any customizations, if you've done any kind of automation, then understand how based around it may, may function the same, may use the yep. same calls, the same APIs, but in a different way. So, you know, to, to go and figure out how do we move this across? Yeah, exactly. So, so for example, one of the, one of the features that I've built uh, is a, uh, it's just open sourced, uh, uh, like a write back. It's essentially a write-back script, PowerShell-based, mm -hmm. um, that just reads groups from Azure AD, writing them to on-prem AD. Mm -hmm. So you can run that like every minute. And that means that you can uh, uh, use, for example, the um, uh, privileged groups uh, feature of, uh, of PIM to, to elevate, let's say, into domain admin in your on-prem AD. Mm -hmm. So uh, Microsoft is now adding that to Azure AD Connect. There will be some limitations, but um, um, yeah. So, so that that's like a two and a half year old project that's been powering a lot of um, great scenarios at customers, and um, we're just now seeing that Microsoft is coming with the same same thing in uh, public preview. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. It, it, there's uh, it, it, you, you can never get comfortable. Uh, Microsoft will change something. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, so I work in the ISV world. And so that's where you're, you know, you're, you partner with, but you're always, you know, stay alert to what yeah. they're doing. Um, not that they're coming for specific ISV solutions or part or customizations, but there's some things where, you know, in the partner world, the partner ecosystem, you go create something because why isn't Microsoft filled this gap? Well, eventually they then probably will. Suddenly yeah. they feel it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but you, you, you might, you might, uh, um, you know, a couple of years with a product or services that you provide be making big mm. money doing that. Yeah. When Microsoft fills the gap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what, so what's the, uh, the community situation in your small town? Like, do you have like user groups? Are you doing online stuff? Kind of what, what's, what yeah. Is so, it, so, like, um, it's, it's pandemic? actually, it's not that far from Oslo. So it's like a um, 90 minute by train, which well, so it seems like a lot, but it's, it's okay. So, um, um, but, and there's a few other uh, uh, towns, well, nearby as well. And uh, uh, yeah, there are a lot of user groups, both in the Microsoft space, but also in, uh, well, security and um, um, different topics essentially. So um, great. Um, uh, user groups uh, close uh, and in Oslo there's well Tons, it's, yeah. the, it's the Norwegian yeah. capital so yeah been, been to several events out there over the years and yeah uh, seems trying to think one time in summer everything else is in the middle of the winter which yeah, yeah. Cause you, get the, you get the conference space less expensive so it, of course that's mm. what the bigger events will be but uh, yeah are things kind of getting back to normal or things picking up again from the community side or are they still mostly virtual um it's mostly hybrid now yeah so um it, it's often that they are streamed and um uh, it was like a, a period of uh, limited seating but right now it feels very normal so um 
yeah, uh, and uh, there was like this a few months where everyone was going to have their um, event of some kind at the same time because yeah, I, yeah you had like two years back of, to, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> now we were planning ours here locally, and we ended up pushing ours back to next next year. And yeah, we had some venue issues, but we started looking around dates, and there are events popping up all over the place. I said, let's just go back to our normal time a year from now. Yep. When we're well past all this and we can hopefully get back to the the this the pre-pandemic numbers for our event yeah yeah but, uh yeah because i'm really excited about what will happen to well excited is the wrong word i'm interested in what will happen in with like microsoft ignite and um things like that over time now yeah I, my sense down? is that no, I, my, my sense is that they're going to stick with that new model. And for folks that don't know what we're talking about, Microsoft changed their marquee event, the IT Pro focused event, Ignite. They moved it to a hybrid model, but the, uh, I mean, look, look, there's a, there's strong feedback out there. And Microsoft mm -hmm. has heard that. Um, did you attend by chance? No, okay. only, only by yeah, by a computer. <laughs> yeah, uh, so I mean, I was, it was for me, it was, uh, I was in a competing event, a community yeah. created event that mm. was scheduled months in advance. It was so such short notice. But yeah. the, the difference is that there, there are fewer people there. So instead of it being like a 15 to 20,000 people there, I think there was like three or 4,000 mm -hmm. at most people there. Yeah. Very few Microsoft people went, so you didn't have the product team and engagements. You no. didn't have the massive expo hall. It was split up and different. And even most of the speakers were on screen. So you you show up to go to this event. And yeah, this is to the, watch the TV. <laughs> to watch TV. Yeah. Right. So that was a big complaint about it. And there's reasons mm. for that because like to get Sati to do the keynote and to broadcast around the world in the hybrid, they weren't set up to do that at the convention center in downtown Seattle. They did it yep. back at the Microsoft studios. Like I get that, but yeah, anyway. Yeah. So yeah. my um, understanding is that's the model going forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but, so I'm sure they will get better at it. Uh, or yeah. hopefully they will get better at it. They have to um, get better at it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But it's, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, like I, I hadn't heard anything about build. So there's three marquee events, a build inspire, which is the partner conference, which mm -hmm. I argue you cannot do that model with inspire with the partners. The value is the face to face. If it's all virtual, yeah. then don't hold it. Don't have it. Exactly. Mm. Yeah, because it's pointless. But, I agree. Yeah. But some people out there might disagree. People like just uh, dialing in from home. But the value of going to MVP Summit, which we're having, we're getting back to doing in-person MVP Summits now, mm. which is fantastic. Of yep. Going to Ignite, going to Build, going to Inspire is the face-to-face. -face. I mean, you can go and check out slides or recordings of sessions that's easy to follow up on but you mm. can't replace the human to human interaction no i, I think it doesn't really take all that long to get that interaction because you, you can so even well a few years ago when i went uh, i had a few or i had one question for uh, mark wall which was um, uh, one of the pms in the identity group mm -hmm. and uh, just asked him that got an answer um, gave him my or uh, I, I just sort of this is me. Uh, we talked on email a few times, and then you just have immediate connection. You get the response you need, and then you have sort of well built that um, relationship stronger, essentially. Yep. Well, Very that, useful, even though that took one minute. Right. Well, that that's what's like. I went to. I mean, here's an example of this. I went out to the first uh, in person the team's airlift a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, limited number of, of seats. So MVPs and RDs that were there, we were downtown in Bellevue um, where a lot of the team's organization was, ha was housed. And we did this thing it, it, where it was great is that there were sessions that were going on in two main rooms and topics. You kind of pick which one you want to go back and forth, but at the yep. same time throughout the days, they had meeting rooms where you had product team members that were meeting with one or two people at a time. You had to schedule it to do a deep dive in on certain topics. 
so that they could actually share with people that there's a, like, I went in there and uh, here's an example. Uh, so I went in and was supposed to meet, it was supposed to be one other MVP, but he had to leave early. So it was just me with three product team people. And I've written about and talked about a lot about the chat technology in teams and elsewhere. So the, yep. the various chats and the different technologies that were being used. And I was trying to understand the strategy and and to talk about what that should look like as a single chat underlying technology across each of the different workloads. Right. And so it, it was like an hour, hour and a half conversation with me and these three product team members doing a deep dive on chat. It was, I, I would say, I mean, it's certainly invaluable for me, but I, they took a lot of notes. So I'm yeah. thinking that I gave some value add to them around that to go in, Absolutely. talk yeah. about specific customers, to talk about other competing solutions and do that kind of deep dive, which even if you're presenting, especially online presenting, and I, if I, in a chat window say, hey, I've got some feedback on this and some experience with this thing is like, maybe somebody will follow up and there'll be an email or a call around that. It's like, it, it just doesn't work. When you're in person, I mean, that was a fantastic example, but even it, going to it, it, it Ignite, I can go up and talk to a person you know, as they're coming down off the stage after their session, mm. talk yeah. for a few minutes or schedule a meeting with, with the event. I mean, yeah, just you just cannot, it's where the world is not in a place where you can go into a VR environment and have that experience and no. get value out. So, and um, I think we're a far, far away. Yeah, uh, question is, will that ever, ever happen? Uh, I don't know. Uh. <laughs> somebody, yeah, I don't, I don't want to get into, I don't want to get hate mail from the people that the metaverse people around that, but I have my opinions as well. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I believe in the human connection, but yeah, that's absolutely. Good. Yeah. But, but of course, well, we're used to this, right. But um, let's say in a few years where the IT professionals are, well, they they have never met anyone essentially, yeah. <laughs> and and they do, they used to that way of working. Then um, maybe, but uh, I I don't think sort of uh, anyone above thirty is uh, interested in yeah. interested in that kind of interaction. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree. Well, Marius, listen, I, I need it to to run, but really appreciate the time today. Great to meet you, and I'm See sure you. we'll connect at some point. For folks that want to find you, reach out to you, connect with you, what are the best ways to reach you? Where are you most active social? Yeah, so it's on Twitter, but you can find my handle on goodworkaround.com, which is my blog. Okay. Yeah. Well, of course, I'll have all his social links out on the blog post on buckleyplanet.com, as well as that on YouTube and on the podcast. So you find it wherever you find this recording. You'll be able to find the, the contact info as well. So well, it was great talking to you and catching up. Yeah, same to you. Cheers. Wow!